This time of the year is always hard on me. It's hard on anyone who's lost a mother, I think. And it doesn't just end on Mother's Day. It's a sadness that lingers as long as the discounted cards are out on display. With the lingering profile pictures on Facebook of happy children in their mother's arms. The mental imagery of the flowers that now must be wilting on our grave. Harder still, I lost my sister a year ago yesterday. She was sick my entire life. Diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia at 13. At first, the doctors thought it was just a stress response of a remarkably quiet and sensitive girl to her mother dying in the move. Such a short phrase for such a huge deal. Her mother dying was actually a suicide after years of clinical depression. And the move was an 800-mile cross-country exodus from the backwoods of New England to a Midwestern tech valley. So our father could take a promotion and provide as a single parent. I was only a toddler at the time, so I don't actually remember any of this. It's all a weird blur of toys and long roads and secondhand information relayed to me by distant relatives I only know as voices on the phone. One of my first actual memories is of her banging her head against the refrigerator until blood started pooling under the skin between her eyes, dripping down her nose and onto the floor into a mound of oatmeal strewn with broken ceramic. My father burst through the door and tried to pull her away, but she resolutely continued like a metronome counting beats. He went for her arms first, trying to pull her away and ending up with a hard elbow to the mouth, one of his incisors flying and skittering impossibly loudly against the tile. He finally stuck his hand in between her face and the door, cushioning her skull from doing any more damage, and waited there for an hour until she was too exhausted to move. I was three and I was convinced it was my fault that she had a fit because I had impishly made a face at her. I remember staring into my own bowl, feeling nauseous with guilt and shame. I still can't eat oatmeal, or even look at it head on without feeling disgusted. For a while I had sleep paralysis nightmares that my blood would clot and congeal until it was the consistency of oatmeal, and I slowly froze as my veins started protruding out of my limbs. I didn't realize it at the time, but that day in the kitchen, and the hours leading up to the incident. While she played the airplane game with me, pinched my cheeks, pretended I was her baby doll, would be the longest coherent stretch I would spend with her for the rest of our lives. From there, my sister was taking off her low-grade antipsychotic, and started with adult-level amounts of the atypical drugs and tranquilizers. Risperidone, Clozaril, lots of Ativan. As I write that, I can feel the bottles jingling with pills in my hand. The minor panic I got each time I laid them out on her plate, afraid I had miscounted those identical chemical time bombs. When I was five, and she was eighteen, we were sitting and watching cartoons in our PJs after dinner. The high dosages of meds definitely stunted her emotional growth. On the outside she was eighteen, but on the inside she still reacted to things like she was my age. Plus she would hit lows where she would lose basic voluntary muscle control, like swallowing. That night she had on a Mickey Mouse bib. I would go over and wipe her mouth on occasion. Part of an ongoing doctor game I'd adopted as a coping skill. The lights of the cartoons on the TV cast her face in colors. Gave a shimmery glow to the spittle running down her chin and the wetness in her eyes. I liked seeing her in the half light because it took away some of the eeriness of her light gray eyes following me around the room. If her face had any animation to it, it would have been lovely, borderline beautiful. But as things stood, she reminded me of one of those stationary Halloween decorations with the holographic eyes that would follow you around the room. Her hair was limp, and her arms curled unnaturally back against herself. But I would use my imagination and heal her, make her functional in my mind's eye. I would move her curled arm to ruffle my hair and pretend she would say things like they did on the old black and white TV shows. You little scamp and you're growing into a fine young man. I curled myself against her and pretended she was hugging me. It was so soothing, that easy rise and fall of her chest. 
It made me sleepy. So sleepy, I didn't realize when I dropped my arms. And my sister started holding me on her own. My head started falling against my chest, until I felt a gradual tightening that rapidly started getting uncomfortable. As usual with these memories, my father was a presence in the background, grinding through bills on the computer, or on the phone with a chain of different mental health related professionals and funding programs, hoarsely yelling things like, you promised she would get back her basic motor activity, and she can't make it through a full day at school anymore. Always sounding like he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown or temper tantrum. My sister's health deteriorated proportionally with the ever increasing amount of wrinkles that lined his face. As my sister's arm tightened and I froze with panic, I could hear him pacing upstairs, much too far away to do anything. She pulled me up off the floor and under her chin. Some of the drool brushed against the side of my face and her lank, dark hair went up my nose. I coughed deeply, heart racing. She whispered something unintelligible. Her voice sounded like fabric ripping. I was widely frightened, kicking against the couch, making a squeaking noise as the pressure on my chest became painful. Then as quickly as it happened, it stopped. I slid back down to the floor and immediately started crying my eyeballs out. My father came in and picked me up and asked what was wrong, but I was too tired and far gone at that point to be able to say anything coherent. When I came to and explained, he took me by the shoulders and forced me to look him in the eye. She spoke to you? I nodded, wiping my nose with the back of my hand. He looked over at my sister, who was staring at the wall the way someone else might look out a window. The light from the TV made her shadow flicker, giving her the phantom look of movement. He walked over to her, almost like he was frightened, and lightly touched the back of her head, and then her cheek. She didn't even blink. They made a few more tweaks in her medication until she was stable, almost totally nonverbal, but responsive to a point. She stopped stewing in her own drool, and was able to do things like finger paint and eat carrot sticks. Sometimes she would make happy noises when I came in from school, reaching up for a hug. When she dropped a crayon, she would grunt and gesture until someone helped her pick it up. I was insulated from the loose lips and gossipy pity that goes hand in hand with having a family member with a mental illness. I was a pretty popular kid, always invited to all the birthday parties, doted on by teachers who were quick to coddle me because of the situation at home. All of the regular milestones were treated as twice as significant for me, the son of a single father, the brother of a housebound schizophrenic. I got two smiley face stickers when I mastered my cues. I got shoulder squeezes when I got A's and B's on tests. The adults at birthdays would greet me with exaggerated smiles and hugs before retreating back to their corners to take carrion eating pleasure in my family's pathetic story. At nine, I realized exactly how strange the situation was. It was at soccer practice in between drills, making goofy faces with orange wedges and murdering empty water bottles. On the next field, a team of mentally challenged kids in protective armor were doing their own versions of drills. The guys, revved up on endorphins and boy bravado, started aping their movements. One of the boys not participating, Patrick, started getting visibly red in the face, his ears heating up to match the color of our jerseys. He balled his hands into fists and told them to quit it. This, of course, made the whole thing ten times more hilarious. I patted him on the back. Yeah? Well, my cousin's over there! Patrick was spitting mad at this point and his eyes were getting red. He pushed me away hard. How would you feel if everyone was pretending to be witches on broomsticks? The boys stopped. All eyes were on me, waiting for a reaction. I had no idea what he was getting at, stalling for time, finally giving up. I made an elaborate show of getting on an invisible broomstick and pretending to jet around the group. Everyone except Patrick laughed. No, like your monster sister. I saw her eat a baby bird on the playground. I stopped dead in my pretend flight. Everyone was quiet. The only sounds were Patrick and I breathing hard, and the kids on the far field laughing in the distance. Our coach, maybe sensing the unnatural quiet, blew his whistle, calling us back for the next drill. I played through confused tears, avoiding meeting anyone's eyes. When I got home that night, I sat quietly through dinner, playing with my food, sneaking glances at my sister in her adult high chair. The idea was permanently implanted in my head, like a viral infection made out of thought. 
It wasn't that far of a leap to make. My tall, gaunt, pale sister, with a face that could have been beautiful if it was capable of expression. At one point, she started making happy gurgling noises as she ate her mashed potatoes. They both looked at me with surprise, my father's tinged with anger, my sister's with the naive sadness of a puppy that was stepped on. I ran from the table up to my room and threw myself on the bed, breathing hard. My father came in a few steps behind me. At first, he looked fighting mad, but he softened when he saw my face. I detailed out what had happened, between sobs. He sat down on the bed, a faraway look on his face. He hesitated a few times before starting. Your sister... your sister is sick. Very sick, son. You know that. He squeezed my shoulder and brought me in for a half hug. She's not a witch. Hell, if she was, she'd probably be able to cure herself. I looked up at him, unable to read his expression in profile. His chin was covered in stubble, and his mouth was pinched like an old man's. Her mother was like that too, at the end. He reached for the picture on the bedstand, the only one I knew of with the four of us, against the backdrop of a sweeping cabin surrounded by thick foliage. His hand hovered over it, hesitating with emotion. Your mother, she was so beautiful. I know you're too young to remember, but that house in the woods, it was like a fairy tale. It was just, just us up there, just us, no one for miles. He sighed and put it down. People will always have something to say about her, but you know her better than they ever will. You know what she is, who she is. As if on cue, my sister started keening, lonely in the kitchen by herself. He got up from the bed. I have to get back down. I'll bring your plate up soon. I fell asleep in my soccer uniform above the bedding, waking up to my half-finished dinner on my bedside table. I became obsessed with the supernatural after that. I wanted her to be a witch. I wanted her to get better, more so than what science seemed to be capable of. I started googling the history of the occult, reading what PG material I could through the parental filters, and then learning to bypass the child locks to get to the good stuff. I collapsed in on myself, and became quiet and introverted, starting wearing a lot of black. A baby goth once I hit puberty. No one was surprised. It was sort of like my early childhood was just staving off the inevitable depression I was bound to suffer through. The third generation of brooding mental discord. My father learned to sit at a table in dead silence, with two children staring at him blankly. I learned to love my sister more, enjoying her bizarre chattering, the looks we got when we went out in public. I never took the brunt of her erratic mood swings. She would lash out at my father, at her nurse, at her doctors. But with me, she was always quiet. She liked to just sit in my room and watch me, while I was playing video games, doing my homework, the usual boring stuff. Sometimes she would come up behind me and use one of her doll brushes to comb my hair. I was never afraid of her. As a teen, I was willfully ostracized, even from the other goths and misfits I sat with at lunch. It was impossible to have anyone actually come over to the house. It came down to two scenarios. Either they would come if my sister was boxed away somewhere, or they wanted to see her in action, like a sideshow attraction. Most often it was some mixture of both. A few times I made exceptions, mostly for pretty girls with piercings and dark lipstick, that hinted at promises of a reward if I made an exception for them. The last one was Beth, an emo chick through and through, who wore band t-shirts and tight ripped jeans like it was her school uniform, and had a secret stick poke tattoo of an apple on her ankle. She came over with a couple of wine coolers she swiped from her parents' Mary Poppins purse of a liquor cabinet, always full and nothing ever noted as missing. She walked up to my sister's room without prompting. The nurse had just finished getting her dressed, a shapeless dress with pockets for her toys and art supplies. When Beth got there, she was sitting in the middle of her room in front of her easel, crayons and paints splayed out across the newspaper-covered floor. I vaulted the steps to catch up with Beth to make the introductions. But I was late, and the chain of reactions was already set in motion. My sister was already shaking like a leaf, crouching like a scared cat. Beth laughed a little in surprise, holding out her hand like she was at a petting zoo. My sister reached out for her with a gentleness and maturity that surprised me. Hello. Beth's voice seemed a little disappointed by how utterly normal the situation was. She shifted her weight, the bottles clinking against each other in the bag. The window was open 
and the wind tousled my sister's hair and a few of her stuffed animal's fur placed on a shelf against the wall. The room, albeit much too young for someone in her twenties, was extremely neat thanks to the efforts of my father and my sister's nurse. Both women looked at me expectantly, hand in hand. I noticed my sister was still shivering and walked around to comfort her. I'm number eight's friend, Beth. She was obviously getting increasingly more bored by the second. Her heavily mascaraed eyes darted around the room, looking for any sort of material she could take back with her to her friends. A secret little part of me hoped she would find it. Something that sent her heart beating faster made me interesting and special in her eyes. My sister continued to sit quietly, with her uncanny way of looking curious and vacant at the same time. Beth let go of her hand and did a quick tour around the room, as nosy as possible without actually being intrusive. She peeked in an open drawer and picked up a few figurines off the dresser. <sighs> well, I guess we should go into your room. She sounded defeated, but it was music to my ears. An actual attractive teenage girl in my bedroom. I crouched down to give my sister a hug goodbye. Out of the corner of my eye, Beth idly opened up a closet door, running her hand along the clothes inside. <coughs> she lunged so quickly it knocked me back on my ass. My sister was across the room and onto Beth like something rabid. Beth's head snapped back against the closet door, banging it shut with a snap. She must have been out for 15 seconds or so before she even reacted to my sister's nails scraping against her eyes. She didn't even scream. She just started bawling. I rushed over, grabbing hold of her hands before she could do any more damage. Beth's face was a mess. In abject horror, I felt the weight of the pencil, covered in blood and broken, drop out of my sister's hand. Her big gray eyes met mine, then turned sadly down to Beth's ruined face. I led her out of the room, holding her hand with a white-knuckled tightness while I dialed 911 with the other. Her nurse was sitting at the dining room table with headphones on, bopping her head up and down with the music. As I pulled away from my sister to get her attention, our fingers were stuck together for an extra second with the tackiness of the blood. I'll never forget that feeling. Beth wasn't blinded like I had first assumed. She walked around school for a few weeks after she got out of the hospital with blood red eyes from the broken capillaries, and she had a set of three nasty long scars that ran through her eyebrow. But fine aside from that. In a twisted way, even better than fine, because the scars seemed almost artfully placed on her symmetrical face, and she had the juiciest of stories to tell, one that got bigger and more bizarre with each retelling. She flung me across the room with a wave of her hand. She went for the neck to try to suck my blood. That's why I have the scar here. Her mother killed herself in a satanic sacrifice. That's how she got her powers. My sister became a local legend and in the wake of the lawsuit from Beth's parents, a ward of the state. We couldn't afford to move again, especially away from my sister, now more medicated than ever and sleeping her life away in an institution. I completely withdrew from everything aside from schoolwork. I stopped doing the goth thing and invested in a strict wardrobe of button-down shirts and slacks. I made a few cautious friends in some of the tech clubs I joined. I became a mathlete. I poured myself into normalcy and into the possibility of a calm, uneventful adulthood. My father poured himself a few thousand drinks and found a nice comfy solace in the bottom of a glass. I was accepted to a state university with enough scholarships to give me a full ride as long as I coupled it with a work-study program. I declared my major early, pharmaceutical chemistry, an homage to my earlier days obsessed with the occult, and a fuck you to the small town gossips. The brother of the witch, going to school to essentially perfect the age-old art of making potions. It was a heavenly six hours away from the town I grew up in, far away from the stigma, the stories, and the quizzical, sometimes hostile looks. The only times I went home were to drag my father out of his stupor to visit my sister at the institution. Until the most recent trip, when he finally drank away the house, and I came home to pack everything up to move him to an apartment. Towards the end, the last room that was left was my sister's. It was mostly empty. We had moved most of the necessities to her room in the facility, and donated almost all of the rest. I pulled down the empty hangers, picked up a few wayward socks in the back of the closet. There was a set of drawers built into the wall, intended for shoes, that had stayed empty for as long as I could remember. My sister had at most maybe three pairs at a time. I pulled the first two out, 
finding nothing but dust in the wayward bug carcass. In the third, there were three cloth pouches bound in thin string. I took them all out in one light handful, thinking they were maybe button bags for some long gone clothes. Something about the weight of them stopped me from immediately throwing them in with the rest of the garbage. I pulled at the string from the first one, my dust covered nails filthy looking against the whiteness of the cloth. Teeth spilled out into my palm. Four tiny, human teeth. My heart started beating faster. I grabbed my box cutter out of my pocket, not wanting to waste any time with the next pouch. I nicked my finger in my haste and swore loudly. Is everything all right? My father slurred from downstairs. I could hear the mover's boots echoing and grunts as they moved the furniture. My father had probably settled down for the last bottle of Johnny Walker in his recliner. Fine, I called back distractedly. The next pouch had at least a month's worth of pills. They spilled out of my hand and across the floor, skittering across the hardwood. I dropped them all, terrified at what I might find in the third. A delicate white ball fell to the floor, cracking on impact. I bent to pick the pieces up, matching them together. A skull. I ran my thumb across the front, feeling a tiny point. A baby bird skull. I flew out to my car, almost clipping the moving van in my rush to get out of the driveway. I knew the visiting hours at the institution ended at 6, meaning I had one hour to drive what would usually take 90 minutes. My head was flooded with memories. Of Patrick's disgusted face on the soccer field, my sister's desperate attack to protect her hidden treasures, Beth's grand illusions in the lunchroom. The secret dreams I clung to when I was younger, that my sister's illness might have some kind of darkly beautiful otherworldliness to it, that she might get better. I got there with 15 minutes to spare. The orderly at the front desk looked me up and down quizzically. I looked myself over. I couldn't blame him. I was covered in dust, sweating through my t-shirt, with throbbing eyes and bulging pockets. Thankfully he couldn't see what was inside. Bones and pills. In that moment, I really belonged there. There's only a few minutes left. I know. I just... I need to talk to her. He gave me one more hard look, then slid the sign-in sheet to me. He looked it over. This patient is nonverbal. He called out as I ran walked away. I raced up to her room. I looked through the window set at the top of the door. She was lying down, as per usual, faced away from the door. I knocked lightly and she turned at the noise. Her face was lined like an old woman's twice her age, but her eyes were still the huge, youthful gray of an eternal kindergartner. They lit up looking at me. She sat up and held her arms out to me. Her lips were terribly chapped and trembling. My heart broke a little, as it always did. I returned her hug and lingered. It took an effort to push her away. I reached into my pockets and pulled the contents of the pouches onto the bed between us. She ran her fingers through them, and then put her hands back in her lap. She looked up at me, her eyes limpid. Is this... a spell? I couldn't actually say the words looking at her. She was in one of those cloth hospital gowns, with pink fuzzy socks on. She kicked them back and forth innocently. I changed tactics. What is this? Her face fell. She ran her fingers through the mess again, then looked at me with an astounding amount of clarity. I wondered if they had finally perfected whatever magical cocktail her brain needed. She brought her hands up to my cheeks. My heart pounded as she worked to speak. The orderly. He looked very nonplussed. I quickly gathered up the weird objects from the bed before he could see and stood up. My sister started getting flustered. You. The orderly and I stared at her in shock. You. The word was clear as a bell. You. You, 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 you. The word was caught up in her sobs. She threw herself down on the bed and then hard against the wall. Hard enough for the orderly to be shaken out of his reverie and to spring into action. You, 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 you. I backed away from the door and into the hallway. The orderly must have hit an oh shit button because I was suddenly in the tide of medical personnel with a loud alarm blaring in my ears. I slipped through them as unobtrusively as possible. I drove home in silence, mentally berating myself at being so delusional. I drove to the house I grew up in one last time to my father sleeping upright in his armchair. He must not have let them pack it in, I thought, laying down beside him on the bare floor, 
staring up at the ceiling. I slept there that last night, in an empty house full of memories. We woke up to the phone call that my sister had committed suicide. My father handed the phone over to me almost immediately, stone-faced and with mottled skin from his hangover. He left quietly while I listened to the doctor continue. She had been taking pills. We have no idea where she was hiding them. I thought about the pills I had spilled out onto the bed, feeling my stomach cramp with guilt. I had no way of knowing if I had left any of them behind. I would think that they would be mostly ineffective after so many years, but if there had been enough of them, my thoughts swam and sank. There were no cameras in the room, so there was nothing to link me to the incident. There was no real investigation. When someone dies young, we mourn the person they could have been, what else they could have brought into the world. No one had trouble sleeping over what my sister's loss meant, aside from my father and me with our threadbare memories of that girl who once was. We didn't have a funeral. It would have been the two of us and a hundred overtly obvious bystanders, waiting to see if she erupted in flames or rose from the dead to fly around the graveyard. We had a viewing of sorts, as next of kin when we went to the morgue. My father left after a few long minutes, running outside to throw up in a trash can. I stayed long enough to hold her hand one last time. Then we had her cremated and inurned, so in effect, I suppose, she did go up in flames. I debated turning the teeth over to the police, eventually deciding to keep them for myself. Odds were they were either hers or mine from our tooth fairy days, and my innate sense of self-preservation screamed at me to take care of it myself. I had a university lab at my fingertips, and minimal supervision from my advisors as long as I got my work done. I had a classmate who owed me one, I had been the only one to answer a panicked 2am group text he sent out freshman year. Guys, I'm trying to do my work cited for the anatomy paper that's due at 8 and the words of falling into the keyboard is... Is something wrong with Microsoft? He was drunk and residually tripping from earlier in the day. I rode my bike over to his dorm and just did it for him. He was doing his work study in a forensics lab down the hall from mine. I took a vial of my blood and asked him to run the teeth against it as a favor for my project I was working on for an independent study. It took about a month before he had the free time to do it. So, let's just say they both swipe right on that shit, man. He waggled his eyebrows at me. Seeing my utter apathy, he coughed and looked back at his computer screen, embarrassed. It's a mother-son match, a sibling match, AND a father-son match. I'm really fucking proud of myself for this one, actually, being as he gave me a random assortment of the teeth, a tiny vial of blood, and nothing fucking else to go on. I had to do 20 markers three times over. They're totally obliterated, by the way. I hope you didn't have to return them. He scrolled through the results quickly, taking a sip from a coffee mug that smelled like Gatorade and maybe vodka. So, your project's about incest? The words hung in the air. I had been turning in the computer chair to leave. My fingers dug into the arms of the chair an inadvertent reflex. Shit's so fucked, man. Backwoods hillbilly bullshit. Can't believe it still happens. I wouldn't have even caught it if it wasn't for the aplastic anemia. Is Warner your advisor? He has to be. He gets, like, all the gruesome shit from his sister-in-law. She's a lead detective a few counties over. He grabbed a thick handful of paper from the counter, fastening it together with an alligator clip and handing it over to me. So what's your thesis? I I'm working on it. I reached for the packet with numb fingers, and he pulled out of reach teasingly. I grabbed it, bunching the papers in the process. Come on, let's have it! Possible chemical treatments for a consanguinous disease in utero. I got up from the chair, pulling the report with me. He let go begrudgingly. That's broad and really theoretical. Plus the words keep falling off the page as I type them. He laughed, waved me away, and took a sip from his mug. Aight, dude. I knew what I was going to do before I even left the lab that day. I felt completely calm, aside from a little worried to hear that I might be anemic. I drove to my father's apartment, grabbed some Chinese food, along with a bottle of ibuprofen and another of scotch. 
I stood in the kitchen, making small talk with him in the living room as I prepared an ice cube tray and a glass of hot water. I dropped the pills in, one by one, dissolving them thoroughly and making sure I gauged the amount with as close to perfect accuracy as possible. Not enough to kill him, but enough to wreck his already failing liver. A potion of eternal, painful sleep. His neighbor found him a little less than a week later, emaciated, dehydrated, half awake in his own waist. His body has been slowly shutting down since. When his speech went, I started visiting him in the residual care facility he lives at now. He's on a respirator, but not a heart monitor yet, so we have time. While the nurses are there, I talk about how well I'm doing in school. I was just accepted into the doctorate program, and I have two job prospects with major pharmaceutical companies. I talk about the cute nursing major I've been seeing, how much more energy I have now that I'm taking iron supplements. I talk about the weather. And when we're alone, we have long talks about his twisted brain and how many lives he's ruined, pulling strings like a spidery ringmaster. We talk about how powerful he must have felt, chemically lobotomizing a child so she couldn't tell on him. I bring the family pictures and the ones he had tucked away for a rainy day. For company, he has the ashes. I leave when the tears run down his face. I think proudly about my history now, as the last surviving witch from a family of witches. And more than that, I am my mother's son. <laughs>